Ladies and gentlemen, please sit down. Speech and opening by Dean Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Sciences Universitas Diponegoro to Professor Dr. Bambang Walayo Hedi Eko Prasetyono. Time is yours. Baik, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. With all due respect, the guest lecturer, Professor Hui Wen Chuang, PhD, from Bio Agriculture Department, National Jai University, Taiwan. The head of agriculture department, the head of agro ecotechnology study program, the colleagues, the students, and all of the participants. First, let us say thank you to Bud for his grace that we can enter in this occasion. The pandemic situation presents challenges and opportunities for the higher education sector. This makes the international academic activities requiring new program formulation. Online guest lecture or online visiting professor become new formulation in the current situation. Actually, this is a, an opportunity that can be obtained from the global pandemic situation. That what is increasingly borderless. Students can very easily attend lecture from professor in another country such as from National Chiai University, Taiwan. Professor Chuang and participants. Faculty of Animal and Agriculture Sciences, Universitas Diponegoro, is currently in a better ranking position in animal and agriculture sciences subjects, according to the version of Ministry of Education, Research and Technology, QS, and Time Higher Education with class university rank. This condition is triggered by international mobility activities carried by the professor, lecturers, and students in terms of education research and community service activities. One of the contributing activities is guest lecture. In other sides, this activity has the main goal to provide students with broader knowledge and insight on a particular agricultural topics. In addition, by the patient of professor from foreign universities, further collaboration can be initiated both in education and research. So that in the future, there will be further program between Faculty of Animal and Agriculture Sciences, Diponegoro University, and Bio Agriculture Department of N. Bio Agriculture Department of National Chai University of Taiwan. When the COVID-19 condition has recovered, we are very happy welcoming Professor Chuang to visit Diponegoro University located in the Semarang City, Sindra Jawa, Indonesia. Hopefully, one day, it can be realized, and then we can do further cooperation. 
and for all students and participants, please gain a smart knowledge and new insight. It's pleasure to welcome you all. With the name of God, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, officially, I open the program. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Professor Dr. Bambang Waluyo Hedi Eko Prasetyana as Dean of Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Sciences, Universitas Diponegoro. The main agenda is a lecture from Professor Wei Wan Chuang, PhD. This session will be led by the moderator, Insinyur Karno, Master of Applied Science, PhD. So, Insinyur Karno, Master of Applied Science, PhD, time is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Bu Bintang. <clears throat> Dear Honorable Dean, Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Science, Honorable Head of Department of Agriculture, also the Chair of Study Program in the Faculty, our lecturer, students, guests, and distinguished guests. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> Today, we have a special guest lecturer from Taiwan, Professor Hui Wen Chuang, PhD, from the Department of Bioagricultural Sciences, National Chia Yi University, Taiwan. Good morning, Prof. Chuan. Good morning. Hope everything is fine. <clears throat> Dear Prof. Chuan, first of all, I'd like to introduce my institution and myself. We are from Agroeco Technology Study Program. Department of Agriculture, Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Sciences, Diponegoro University, located at Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. And my name is Karno. I'm the chair of Agroecotechnology Study Program. <clears throat> Dear Prof. Chuan, as expected by our dean, we have a collaboration in the future. Based on my note, I think we had a collaboration program in the past time with the university in Taiwan. We sent several students and lecturers to attend summer program in Taiwan. And also, we invited several students and lecturers from Taiwan to Indonesia in the summer program, too. I think we already have a collaboration program. Besides that, our junior lecturer, Rosida, he, she graduated from CIE university under your supervision. And finally, we also have uh, one our alumni, Widi Dewi Noviandi, also takes a master program in CIE University under your supervision. Hope in the future more students will study in Taiwan. Dear Prof. Chuan, we regularly invite guest lecturer every year. Last month in October, we invited four guest lecturer from Indonesia. And this month in November, we invited two guest lecturer from Taiwan. <clears throat> So, dear uh, participants, <clears throat> we have a guest lecturer by Prof. 
Wei Wen Chuang to share her expertise in bio agricultural sciences with the title of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria (PGBR) and its application in improving plant quality and plant abiotic stress tolerance. <clears throat> Before we start the lecture, I would like to introduce Prof. Wei Wen Chuang to all the participants. <clears throat> so here in the screen, Prof. Wei Wen Chuang from Department of Bioagricultural Science, National Chiayi University, Chiayi, Taiwan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Her educational background, she finished the Bachelor in Horticulture in 1986 in Chinese Culture University in Taipei, Taiwan. And then she finished the Master in Horticulture in June 1989 at National Chung-Sing University, Taichung, Taiwan. And finally, she finished the PhD in genetic in December 1997 in Texas A&M University College Station, Texas, USA. <coughs> Next slide. Okay, her professional experience started as a deputy director in 2003 to 2004 in Asia Gene Corporation. And then as a assistant professor from 2004 to 2011 at the Department of Bioagricultural Sciences, National Chia University, Taiwan. And then uh, she achieved associate professor in 2011, 2015. And then from 2015, she achieved uh, the highest uh, level of academic background as a professor in the Department of Bioagricultural Sciences, National Chia University, Taiwan. <coughs> Next. <coughs> professor Chuang has uh, many publication paper. Here is the, the latest, the recent publication in 2020 and 2021. Stated that in uh, May 2020, she published uh, one journal article, Streptomyces species mitigates abiotic stress response and promotes plant growth, published in Journal of Plant Protection Research. And then in December 2020, she published common cellular event implicated in regulation of cold stress tolerance and short growth resistance induced by metabolites of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in Palaenopsis orchids. <clears throat> and then in July 2020, she published a transcription analysis Reveal cellular pathway associated with abiotic stress tolerance and disease resistance induced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa in banana plant. Finally, in August 2021, she published Rhizobacteria bacillus mycoides function in stimulating the antioxidant defense system and multiple phytohormone signaling pathway to regulate plant growth and stress tolerance. <clears throat> okay, I think all the publication uh, so her expertise in bio agricultural science. <clears throat> okay, dear Prof. Chuang. 
This lecture is attended by many students, lecturer, and guests from other institutions. For this lecture, we have plenty of time. We plan we can finish by 1 p.m., but we hope we can finish by 12 at noon. <clears throat> so you can give the lecture for about one or uh, one and a half hours. Okay. And then we continue with discussion. Maybe after the presentation, we take a break for maybe 15 minutes and then we continue with uh, discussion. So let's start the lecture. Right. We have Prof. Chuang, okay. the screen and the time is yours. Okay. Please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. And right now, can get started for this uh, presentation. So everybody see the slide, okay? Yes. Yes. Clear. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, Ochi gave me this uh, topic. Uh, it's about the uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria using uh, in uh, plant growth uh, improvement and uh, biostress tolerance. Okay. Um. So I would like to give uh, everybody have a brief introduction about uh, this subject. Okay, so let me see. Okay. I think, it, can you see this okay? Because when I use the full screen, uh, the heading is being covered. So is this slide okay? It's okay. Okay, all right, so let's go through this slide. Okay, all right, so, uh, uh, the reason use uh, this uh, PGPR in this use in agriculture is because uh, agriculture is most important uh, practice uh, in uh, human civilization. Okay, and so since it's so important, and uh, uh, the people in all of the world try to get a uh, high ear and get a good quality, so they will tend to use a lot of uh, chemical fertilizer and also the pesticide. Okay, and I think including Taiwan. Therefore, they will cause uh, a lot of contamination problem in uh, lots of countries, okay? And in recent decades, uh, people get more attention, uh, try to use uh, less harmful chemical for uh, in our cultural system, cultural system. And so they come out a name called uh, biostimulants, okay? So in this figure, you can see, let me see, okay. Uh, so biostimulant is uh, defined as a natural material uh, or organism that can be used in, uh, in promoting plant growth and flowering or control fruit quality and more is like uh, increased plant tolerance to like uh, different kind of biostress or biotic stress. There are different kind of classification for biostimulants. And I use the simplest one. And in here you can see uh, people can classify a biostimulants as a, like a protein hydrolyse or like a seaweed extract and humic acid. And also including plant growth promoting a rhizobacteria. Okay, so uh, in this biostimulant classification, since plant growth promoting rhizobacteria is uh, more, they got more uh, different kind of uh, PGPR. Therefore, the use or application of PGPR in our, our culture system get more and more common and get more and more important, okay? So in here you can see uh, the PGPR can use as a biofertilizer for some reason, okay? And the Best reason is this uh, PGPR can increase nutrient av availability, okay? And so people are very familiar with like a nitrogen fixation. So uh, 
the bacteria which can fix the nitrogen also is a, a group of PGPR. People consider a group of PGPR. And this equation is the uh, nitrogen fixation uh, equation that this uh, bacteria, they can use uh, nitrogen to fix the uh, nitrogen gas and convert the nitrogen gas become ammonia. And this ammonia can be used by plant. Okay, so they will become a uh, extra uh, nitrogen source for plant growth. Okay, and you can see in the uh, classification of a uh, microorganism. There are some microorganisms can fix nitrogen by itself, but some microorganisms have to be associated with plant cell to get nitrogen fixation activity. The one they can do, do the nitrogen fixation by itself is called free living uh, nitrogen fixation. And the one they have to associate is pr with plant to get nitrogen fixation activity, which is called symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Okay, so most of the soil being like the, the, the legume which fix nitrogen is in the group of symbiotic nitrogen fixation. However, uh, those symbiotic nitrogen fixation had to find the proper host. So they have a, a but the microorganism strains had to associate specific host plant to get this symbiotic nitrogen fixation activity. But the free living uh, nitrogen fixation, they can fix nitrogen by itself. So it's more uh, kind of, uh, it's more flexible to use in agricultural system. Okay, and this figure show you the difference. This is uh, free living nitrogen fixation and this is symbiotic. So symbiotic nitrogen fixation, they have to, uh, uh, to form a nodule to get this nitrogen fixation uh, activity. And the second reason is the, uh, some PGPR, they can have a activity to stabilize a uh, phosphate. Okay, and so we, we are, when we are told in the class that uh, the phosphate usually is, uh, phosphate actually is a mic one of the micronutrients for plant growth, okay? However, when we uh, fertilize plant with uh, a phosphate fertilizer, most of the phosphate fertilizer in the soil is not soluble. It forms as a complex and it cannot be uptake by plants directly. And some of the PGPR actually, they can secrete some organic acid or they can secrete some acetic phosphatase to solubilize the insoluble phosphate complex in the soil. Therefore, they can increase the phosphate uptake by the plant cell. And by doing that, they can enhance plant growth. And some of the PGPR can, can, they can produce like a sulfur, and sulfur is a small molecule, and so there are different kind of form of sulfur. And sulfur they can chelate uh, ferric, uh, the iron. Okay, and this uh, chelate form of the sulfur, when they chelate with iron, they become um, how to say ferric sulfur, and this ferric sulfur can be uptake by plant directly. So by doing that, they can increase the uh, uh, iron uptake by plant cell, okay? And some of the reason they can be classified as a biofertilizer is they can, uh, uh, PGPR can produce phytohormone and uh, they can produce different kind of phytohormone and the, the most famous one, most commonly seen one is uh, endoacetic acid. And uh, indoor acid, acid is called oxygen in the plant cell. And oxygen is involving in plants and growth uh, in different kinds of stages, like uh, from the seed uh, embryo development and from the root growth and to like the shoot growth and eventually in the flowering and full setting, something like that. Okay. However, the microorganisms produce IAA mostly affect the plant. A root system. And this is the most important phenotype that we've seen uh, that the PGPR produce IA that affect a plant root system growth. Okay. And some of the PGPR they can produce like uh, ACC deaminase. And this is the uh, acetyl uh, biosynthesis pathway in the plant cell. 
And acetin, the precursor for acetin by synthesis is from mycelium. It's amino acid. It's a sulfur containing amino acid. And by converting to uh, other mycelium, and then this other mycelium will be converted to ACC and by ACC synthesis. And then ACC synthesis will be converted to acetin uh, by ACC oxidase. Okay. And acetin is kind of a, a stress hormone. Okay, acetin can inhibit root growth. So uh, those microorganisms, the bacteria, which can produce uh, ACC deaminase, they can uh, use the ACC from the plant cell and deaminate this ACC to become ammonia, also butanate. Okay, and so they can reduce the acetin uh, precursor. So can reduce acetin synthesis in the plant cell. By doing that, they can lessen the biostress uh, damage to the plant cell. And another hormone that will, uh, other kind of hormone that were produced by PGPR is like a cytokinin and they will enhance the sucrose. And some PGPR produce ABA, they can enhance the uh, biostress torax because ABA is very important for, to regulate plant biostress response. And some of the microorganisms, they can produce GA. However, GA, uh, the, function, the function for uh, PGPR produce GA is, is, is not uh, studied. They don't, we don't get too much information for this kind of GA produced by PGPR. However, there's some reports say uh, when GA combined with IA can promote root and shoot growth. Okay. So uh, in addition to it as a biofertilizer, and right now people more, uh, uh, more pay, pay more attention to the function of the PGPR acting as an enhancer for a biostrate torus, okay? So we just mentioned about ACC deaminase. And so ACC deaminase can reduce uh, acetyl synthesis in the plant cell. And we can see this is the acetylene uh, synthesis pathway in the plant cell. And this is the physiological or environmental uh, factor that will enhance acetylene synthesis in the plant cell. One is flower senescence and also uh, extra amount of IAA also can cause a uh, production of the acetylene. And wounding, chilling, drought, and flooding, all these kind of a stress factor, environmental stress factor can also induce ACC synthesis activity to increase acetylene synthesis. So if the PGPR can produce ACC, which is efficiently reduce ACC uh, precursor for acetylene synthesis, in that case, we can reduce the acetylene damage to the plant cell under the abiostress environment, okay? And another uh, metabolite produced by PGPR, which is also useful for abiostress tolerance is a volatile organic compound, and which is short for VOC. And uh, these two example VOC is uh, very commonly seen in Bacillus uh, species, uh, two, three, butaniodo. And that, and also dimethyl disulfide. These two uh, VOC is commonly seen in a bacillus species, and those VOC can have an effect, like uh, uh, induce accumulation of hydrogen peroxide and nitrogen oxide in the plant cell. And this hydrogen peroxide is ROS, and nitrogen oxide is RNS. It can act as a signal to activate plant defense response. Okay, and also this VOC can induce accumulation of small protectant, something like protein, trellos, glycine, betaine, and those uh, molecules can help to uh, balance osmotic uh, potential in plant when plant under like drought stress or salt stress. Okay, and also this VOC can 
modulate ABA signal pathway in the plant cell. And as I mentioned before, ABA is considered is a very important a hormone signal when plant under a biotrace condition. And also this VOC can activate anti-arsenic and NAM, which can reduce RS uh, oxidative stress when plant under the uh, a stress condition. Okay, so we're gonna go to a more complicated uh, slide. So under a biotrace condition, plant can accumulate uh, RS, different kind of RS molecule uh, in different cellular location. Okay, so this is the most commonly a cellular, a cellular location that will accumulate RS in plant cell, which is including, first one is chloroplast and mitochondria and peroxisome, and also including cell wall uh, compartment, okay? And in this four contaminant, when pre accumulate uh, RS, they in each compartment, this in each compartment, they also have their anti-Austin, anti-Austin system, AOS, something like this one. This is anti-Austin system right here and right here to, re to reduce the RS stress, to reduce the oxidative stress, prevent the stress getting the damage in the brain cell. And the RS also is considering a, a signal. So they need a little bit of RS to activate plant hormone signal transduction pathway. And the activated signal can uh, regulate transcription factor. And this transcription will regulate the gene expression in the nucleus. And so plant can get a proper response to a biostress uh, tolerance. Okay, so as long as this something like this one, like uh, VOC, which is can activate anti austin uh, system. So the VOC can reduce the RS accumulation in different kind of serial compartment. So plant can get uh, healthier under a bias stress condition. And this is the anti austin system operating in the plant cell and they have a different kind of uh, abbreviation for different enzymes. And you can see the most commonly seen is this one. This square, there's something in this square is ascorbic glutathione cycle. Okay, so they can convert in uh, this, uh, this RS molecule will be uh, redu reduced and it will be reduced to, uh, will be reduced to become like water by a uh, switch between ascorbic by uh, re reduction and oxidation uh, reaction by uh, ascorbic and glutathione, okay? And so this is called ascorbic glutathione cycle. And another way they can reduce RS is, is when the brain cell get, brain cell get the superoxide, something like this one. And also the another antioxidant that the superoxide dismutes can convert this, uh, superoxide to hydrogen peroxide. And later this hydrogen peroxide can be converted to water also by ascorbic peroxidase or uh, guaco peroxidase, something like that, okay? Or by uh, catalase. So this is a uh, very commonly seen uh, anti arsen system in the brain cell. Okay, so the last function for the PGPR is acting as a biocontrol agent. And uh, the way the PGP are acting by, uh, for a biocontrol agent is by producing antibiotics or antimicrobial peptide, or they can produce uh, extracellular cytochrome to kill uh, uh, iron. So because iron is a uh, essential nutrient for all organisms, including uh, microorganism. So by competing I, uh, by a, a secreted cytochrome, they can eliminate the uh, iron from being used by other microorganisms, such as like a pathogen. So they can, by doing that, by chelating the uh, iron, so they can suppress the, uh, the growth for the pathogen. 
And another uh, compound they can use to supply, uh, suppress the uh, uh, microorganism growth is by uh, uh, secrete produced VOC. So the VOC can uh, activate brain uh, response for a bias trace. And VOC also can have activity to suppress a uh, pathogen growth. And this, this, those compounds are commonly seen in the PGPR, which can have a biocontrol activity. And more important thing is the PGPR, they can uh, act as a biocontrol agent by activating brain uh, immunity. And there's two immunity in the brain cell. One is called induced systemic resistance. And in this case, just morning acid is the uh, the signal molecule, just money acid or uh, acid is a signal molecule, okay? And the other induced uh, immunity is called uh, activate, uh, systemic acquired resistance called SAR. And silicic acid is a, is a signal molecule in this uh, immunity. And this is the photo we get from uh, the plant phase uh, test book. So you can see SAR actually is from the roots. Okay, so the, typically the uh, rhizobacteria uh, associated with the plant root, they can induce SAR in the plant cell and the signal molecule is JA and uh, acetylene. And uh, SAR is from the area part of the plant. So when the area part of the plant get infected by a pathogen and this infection will trigger plant SAR response and trigger the uh, synthesis of silicic acid. And they will get, so this will circulate in the brain cell, a whole body to activate the whole of the systemic uh, resistance. So this is to induce immunity in the brain cell. And in the old time, people always think uh, PGPR should only activate SAR because it's from the roots. However, the recent studies show that uh, SAR and uh, ISR and SAR both involved in PGPR activated disease resistance. Okay, we can find some example later. Okay, so uh, this is the brief introduction for PGPR. Now I will give you the uh, more example that we get, the, the result that we uh, get from our lab, the study on the PGPR. So we first published this data in 2018. And we, this isolated uh, PGPR is bacillus lichenformis, okay? And we call it CH102. And the good thing for bacillus lichenformis is uh, they, they, this is a glass a strip because uh, this uh, bacillus lichenformis is, they call generally recognized as safe PGPR. So if you use this PGPR in the environment for our culture, you, do not require lots of tests like a toxicology test or something like environmental test, okay? So it's called glass strength. So usually people like to use glass strength because it can save a lot of money for testing this bacteria in the field. So by using the uh, sitting as RDNA sequencing, we find a phylogenetic tree. This one is belong to uh, one of the strains like uh, Bacillus lichenformis. And we try to find out whether this bacillus lichenformis is a uh, have antifungal activity. So this is a dual dual assay. It's because this uh, in the middle this is a pathogen, uh, Fusarium uh, oxyspora. Uh, it's a banana Fusarium uh, banana Fusarium wheat pathogen. Okay, and you can see this CHO1 can suppress the bacillus growth of the this Fusarium, Fusarium pathogen. And this is a volatile inverse is by using the volatile from uh, this bacteria. You can see it still can in, uh, inhibit uh, the, the growth of the mycelium a little bit. So for this bacteria strain, they can, they, can, they, can, they can produce both like a diffusible or volatile compound to separate this uh, pathogen growth. And we test this, uh, whether this bacteria can produce like a volatile compound or the diffusible compound, so uh, in their genome. So this is the PCR, we try to verify the gene that located in this particular strain. 
And these two genes is for making antibiotics. And these two gene fragments making for VOC. And the VOC that we targeted in this particular strain is uh, butanidol. Okay, so the end part, they all get positive fragment for both the antibiotics and the VOC compound. And this particular strain also produce low concentration of IAA and a middle level of the phosphate stabilization activity. So I test this PGPR in the print course, using it in the abdosis is a model print for uh, print experiment. So you can see this uh, PGPR can enhance the uh, root hair and also they can increase the print fresh weight uh, significantly. And also they can increase the chlorophyll content and surprisingly, it increased the hydrogen peroxide uh, concentration in this uh, uh, the treated dosis plant. And also they can increase the antioxidant inactivity in both catalysts and WACO peroxidase. And we test this PGPR in enhancing the uh, histories. So you can see here is the, uh, this is a control plant that, and this is a, uh, treaty plan that is supposed to is supposed to the heat stress, which is 45 degrees uh, Celsius, treated for 25 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, and then transfer back to the 23 degree uh, growth chamber. And after the trim, uh, heat stress, you can see this control plan get more well to plan and compare with the treaty plan. And after one week of uh, recovery, you can see in the con uh, the treaty plan get uh, larger uh, print size than the control print. So concluding that the treatment of the, this uh, bacterial lichenformis can enhance abdosis history tolerance. And then we also try in drought stress. And so this is a control print without treatment of uh, this bacillus lichenformis and is treated with the bacillus lichenformis. And then we uh, stop watering for seven days. And then you can see at the end of the seven days uh, 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 drought treatment, you can see the control plant get us a weighty plant and uh, compared to the treated, uh, treated plant. And also after seven days recovering for the watering and most of the control plant is all, uh, they, get, they did not survive. However, in the uh, treated plant, they got a healthier plant. So uh, we are, our conclusion is this, uh, this treatment, this uh, bacillus nitroformis also can increase the salt, uh, drought strain tolerance in abdosis plant. And we usually like to take a look at the mechanism. Okay, so the make, uh, by using the gene uh, analysis. Okay, so we try two experiments. One is using the Western blood. The other one is using the qPCR to take the gene expression level in RNA level. Okay, so you can see this, this uh, particular strain can actually uh, activate PR, it's a pathogenesis related protein. So that means they can enhance the brain disease resistant uh, response. And also they can increase the nitrate reductase, the and not involving nitrogen assimilation. Okay, and also the other gene is glutamine synthesis, is also the other gene involved in uh, nitrogen assimilation. That means this treatment, particular treatment can increase the brain uh, nitrogen assimilation uh, efficiency. And in here, the QPCR analyze, this two is antioxidant and not. And this is the photosystem two protein. And this is a nitrate transporter. This is a phosphate transporter. And this is the anti- uh, is the end up involving synthesis of anti compound. Okay, so all this gene is upregulated by this bacteria stream. And so we try to do the, this is RNA-seq, is you can, uh, RNA sequence, RNA-seq is a experiment, you look at the whole genome gene expression, and we classified uh, uh, about over 600 of those genes. And we found that those genes uh, activated by this particular strain uh, is involved in different kind of uh, plant uh, cellular pathway. And uh, very importantly is this particular strain also activate a gene that called raspberry first oxidase. 
this one is producing hydrogen peroxide in the uh, cyto, uh, cell wall uh, location. So uh, I don't know whether you remember this. We have a uh, first one here is when we look at uh, the hydrogen peroxide uh, concentration in uh, this bacteria treated uh, after this we find out is increased hydrogen peroxide uh, concentration. So this result is consistent with our uh, observation in the print uh, experiment. And we also find out the gene which upregulated is involved in the abide traits. And most of the gene uh, involved in, uh, associated with abide trait is history tolerance and os osmotic stress tolerance, which is consistent with our test in the advanced trace experiment. And also the average gene that is uh, encoding transcription factor is ERF gene. And this largest uh, group is ERF gene. And ERF transcription factor is regulated by JA, just morning ASC signal pathway. So we also uh, make a find out that the gene involving hormone synthesis in this treaty plan is the, the large uh, gene group is involved in just morning acid synthesis. And this is the JA by synthesis gene in, uh, obligated by this particular strain. And also the gene involving ABA synthesis. And uh, this is a type of why so and okay. And also ABA synthesis and also obligated gene involving oxygen response. However, we see that this uh, bacteria uh, treatment increase the gene involved in JA uh, homogeneous, uh, homogeneous uh, homeostasis. And most of the gene controlling JA homeostasis in this experiment is negative, uh, negative regulate JA uh, biosynthesis. And this is the experiment we use the qPCR to verify the gene we identify in RNA seq experiment. And the transcription factor we find out uh, in this experiment is the most the majority group is AP2 transcription factor, and this is regulated by the JM uh, signal pathway. And then the gene involving in AP2 transcription factor have the function involving cold stress heat stress and osmotic stress. And in this experiment, we identify heat stress and osmotic stress phenotype. And also we found out they induce the gene involving um, MAMP induced response, okay? And WACI-30 and WACI-33. And these two transcription factors is regulate oxidative stress, salt stress tolerance. And, and this WACI-33 is regulate uh, this is resistant against narcotic fungal disease. And also another uh, peptide system is activated. And this uh, peptide system is two, three gene, HEP1, two, and three. And this peptide uh, system is uh, regulate plan immunity against like a herbivore resistance. And this is a QPCL used to verify the gene expression. So the conclusion for this uh, CH102, why this CO2, CH102 can have so much function is we think the CH102 is a good activator to activate RBOH uh, and NAM and to induce hydrogen peroxide uh, signal and they will increase the JA signal. And the JA signal can uh, later regulate ABA signal and to regulate this salt stream is involving a, a, a bias trait tolerance. And the JA signal can regulate the transcription factor involving in heat stress tolerance. And also can uh, regulate plant root hair development and antioxidant activity. And also this particular strain can produce volatile compound and antibiotic. And those uh, two compounds can involve in induced systemic resistance and they can enhanced brain disease resistance, okay? So this is the first experiment we uh, report, we publish uh, a couple hello, years hello. ago. Yes. So should I stop right now? Hello? Is time up? It's okay, still have plenty of time. Huh? Can you I can continue? Go, yeah, you can continue. How much time I should I still have? 
uh, about 30 minutes is okay. 30, one, three? Yes. Okay, 30 minutes. All right, so we have to go faster. This is the second uh, uh, material we publish is a Slomas originosa. Mm -hmm. And so this bacteria is uh, also is a very strong uh, inhibitor for uh, banana fusarium wheat uh, passage. Okay. And we tried this one in the banana print and we found out this uh, uh, but, but strain can activate banana print growth and also have a lot of function in uh, banana uh, physiology, including like uh, uh, increase the glucose knowledge uh, concentration and also like a nickname uh, concentration. And we try this one in uh, straight torrents that like we tested for the drought stress. You can see here, this banana plant treated with this pseudomonas uh, strain can increase the soil straight torrents. And also we, and in addition to increase the uh, soil straight torrents, they also increase the root enhance the, the root growth in banana plant. And also you can see that this uh, treated plant, they can increase the tolerance to hypoxia. This is, we, we do it in uh, submerge. We uh, submerge the banana plant under the water. Okay, so uh, the treated plant, they get higher tolerance to this uh, hypoxia tolerance. And plant treated with this uh, slomana strand get higher resistance to uh, banana fusarium wheat. Okay, so you can see this infection rate get much lower after uh, uh, treated with uh, Pseudomonas uh, Y1 strain. And we also did the transcriptome uh, assay for this one. We found out this banana plant treated with this PAY1, they got a, a new signal that they increase the single lipid uh, signal. This is a very uh, highly expressive uh, upgraded by this uh, PAY1 strain. And we also find out the majority of this uh, uh, signal pathway regulated by this PAY1 is a JA and ABA and auxin. However, cytokine, you can see here, cytokine is negative and positive regulator in involved upgraded by PAY1. And in, uh, in addition to the hormone signal, uh, unregulated by the PA11. We also identify gene that involving regular nutrient ability, and then also uh, involving a bi-straight torrents and bi-straight torrents, okay? And we test in uh, Western bra because banana is not a model print, so we don't have so much gene available. And we test the Western bra, try to verify the transcriptome data, and we found out it's consistent with our transform result, which is like uh, this uh, PL1 can activate the gene involved in uh, PL1 is a pathogenic protein and antioxidant system, and also nitrate uh, reductase, and also the LOX is uh, so JA synthesis, and also this CDC2 is for cell division. So we have a conclusion for PAY1. Uh, uh, function in the plant cell is this bacterial strain actually can uh, activate like a signal lipid uh, signal and actually can activate J signal later. And this J signal can activate ABA signal in downstream and regulate the gene involved in drought stress, hypoxial stress, torrents. And also this uh, J signal can actually uh, regulate like nitrogen ductase and CCT2, they regulate plant growth. And also this J signal is good activator for antioxidant system and also for uh, pathogenesis really protein for uh, disease resistance. And we also identify this one in the transcriptome data is this J signal can actually uh, regulate the plant, uh, the plant physiological response for disease reason, including program cell deaths and activation for uh, PPO oxidase and catalase, uh, chitinase and glutonase and transcription that contributed for ERF1B. And ERF1B uh, expression is co already uh, correlated with banana fusion re resistant uh, is studied before, okay? And also we found out this uh, PA11 can actually enhance the 
plain cysteine oxidase gene expression, and this gene is actually oxygen sensor. Those, and this gene expression can actually activate brain detoxification uh, activity and activate brain nutrient availability regulation. And so they can let brain get more uh, resistant to hypoxia stress. Do I, uh, uh, do I have uh, more time for this lecture? Is there some left for the for this lecture? Yes, you can explain more. Oh, okay. Because I have another one, so maybe we can go quickly. So this is um at the experiment for my uh, PhD student. He just graduated um this year. Okay, uh, actually in uh, September. Okay, so he published this one, and then there's a bacillus mycotis. So this mycotis is uh have uh, some uh, features that would analyze the IA production, JA production, and also phosphate solubilization activity. And also this one can promote plant root growth. And also enhance the sugar growth in our doses and increase the chlorophyll content and increase the starch content. And this uh, particular strain mycotis also can promote uh, the uh, antioxidant activity in the plant cell. Okay, and also they uh, activate uh, the metabolism pathway for synthesis of antioxidant compound in the abdosis plan. And also the treatment of this uh, Rikoti strain, they can enhance drought stress tolerance and also enhance the, this is the heat stress tolerance. And again, we also, uh, because we did not try transcriptome as nice as for and this uh, strain, we only try the QPCR. So in his QPCR experiment, we try the gene involved in uh, JA synthesis is uh, MIG2 and uh, lipo oxygenase one and also involved in salicylic acid uh, singular pathway. And also the anti oxidant pathway, and then for the abiostrase pathway, and also for the uh, pathogenesis pathway, and it all turned out positive. And in this experiment, we found out this mycotis can activate both JA and uh, acid, uh, uh, acid pathway to uh, activate disease resistant and antioxidant resistant and abiotic tolerance. And here, the antioxidant can have function in both disease resistant and abiotic tolerance. Okay, that will be all for today. Any question for me? Okay, thank you, Professor Chuang, for your explanation. Uh, our moderator seems uh, got the electricity problem, so I can take over for the discussion session. So uh, all participants and students, <coughs> Professor Chuang have explained about the research about PGPR. And I know uh, about three strains that have uh, the Professor Chuang have explained is uh, the work from my friends, Nook, Isa, and Andy, is it right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So from uh, those experiments, uh, they got the three kinds of strain, CH102, PAY1, and then the last is BMA3. And most of those strains, uh, have function in the stress, uh, particularly the biotic stress tolerance through the GA signal. So yeah, GA. Yeah, GA signal. So now is the discussion session. Uh, let me see. Is there any question from the meeting chat, or you guys can raise hand and open your mic or camera and just. I'll give the question to the Professor Chuang. Okay. Adakah pertanyaan dari teman-teman mahasiswa? Ada? Ada. Okay. Ju <laughs> ya, untuk teman-teman mahasiswa bisa bertanya dengan raise hand. Boleh bahasa Indonesia. Nanti kami akan translate. Boleh diketikkan atau boleh teman-teman raise hand. Okay, Professor Chuang, we, we will wait for a couple minutes. For okay. The question. All right. Yeah, ini ada pertanyaan dari Julian. Mau? Yeah. Silakan ada yang bertanya. Silakan Julian, raise hand. 
open your mic and camera. Oke. Okay. Good afternoon, Prof. Chuang. Okay, my voice can hear clearly, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, uh, to Prof. Chuang. First of all, let me uh, I introduce myself. Myself, my name is Julian Christopher Limandara. I'm from Diponegoro University. Uh, so I want to ask about, uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, you, uh, the first one is can PGPR only for the specific plants, uh, and it becomes harmful for the other plants. And second one is uh, when the most effective time of uh, to uh, of the application of PGPR, like in the soil or in the seed, uh, and become like. Uh, before the cultivation or when the cultivation um, when the cultivation thank you okay for the first question is uh, I want to repeat your question is, is whether the PGP can be useful for one species but it's harmful to another species is, am I correct with your first question okay because those PGP are actually isolated from the soil in the rhizosphere Okay, so those PR actually, uh, those, those, those materials trend will guess they mostly they are safe for print because it's already existing in the root uh, area. Okay, so if you, but we do see some uh, result that the one PGPR actually can suppress print growth, but we never seen the PGPR can kill the print or make any disease in the plant. And when we see those PGPR, they suppress plant growth, usually we think we use too high dosage. Okay, so uh, we make this assumption that we reduce the concentration that we uh, apply to the plant, and usually we see the positive result. Okay, so we never try, uh, actually uh, we haven't taken uh, a lot of plant, but the print we test in is in our lab is like a dosis, like the lettuce or like the brassica, tomato print. Okay, those uh print species that usually we use uh, the material in our lab, we don't we never seen that the PGBL we test in our lab can kill those print or do any harmful uh effect on the those print. Okay, but sometimes you don't you don't really get a positive result. Because uh, some PGPR since uh, even though they show it as a bacillus something, but it's still you don't really see too much of the positive response from the plant cell. And the second question was, the question, the second question was, um, the when, when should you apply right mm. the, the the timing for apply the PGPR? And to my knowledge is in Taiwan and some uh, people that are nursery. Uh, uh, nursery business, they use the PGPR when the, a week after they get germinated, the, the, the seeds get germinated. And in our lab, we also do this same, the same uh, operation, okay? And, but sometimes we use the uh, material that we buy from the nursery, but so the plant get bigger. And usually you can do, you can uh, apply those, those PGPR in very young age of the seedling, no problem. So is that all your question? Yes, that's all. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Chang. Okay, good. Thank you, Julian. So Professor Chang, we have uh, another question from okay. meeting chat. Maybe uh, the committee can uh, show the question in PPT slide, but I can read for you. Uh, the question from Nofi, uh, she asks about what the difference between uh, biostimulant protein hydroxide, seaweed extract, humic acid, and PGPR? What the difference between them? And then, yeah, what the advantage of PGPR over the biostimulant to enhance plant abiotic stress tolerance? I think this one, uh, Professor Wang already explained more. Yeah. 
but maybe Professor Chuang can explain more about what the difference between uh, a, a protein hydrocyte seaweed extract, humic acid, and EGPR itself in okay. terms of biostimulant. All right. So protein hydrate, actually we worked with protein hydrolyzer hydro before, <clears throat> but the function for protein hydrolyzer is uh, compared with the PGPR is not that. Uh, PGPR get more diverse function. Mm -hmm. However, the protein hydrolyzer usually is get like, a, you can see the most significant function for protein hydrolyzer is increase the nitrogen uh, use efficiency because you, hydrolyze the uh, protein, which is a big molecule to smaller molecule, which is like a peptide or amino acid. So that will uh, enhance the absorption efficiency for those uh, nitrogen source, like a protein, okay? Because plant cell cannot uptake protein directly from outside. Uh, so if you hydrolyze and become like a smaller molecule, like a peptide or like a amino acid, they can improve the efficiency for uptaking those nitrogen source. And another uh, advantage for protein hydrolyse is the NHS activity is quite high. And, but that will depends what kind of protein source you use. Uh, but uh, not every protein source is getting similar uh, NHS activity. And another one is some protein, the, the peptide that would uh, derive from the protein hydrolyse have special function like uh, act as like a signal in the cell. Now, that, that kind of study already published by working in human body, but we don't know much in plant cell, okay? So I think uh, protein hydrolysis, they may have a, a additional function, but we don't really know this function yet because it's only working on the plant cell. It's not really, uh, not many people working on protein hydrolysis, uh, the, the signal pick in protein hydrolysis in the field right now. Seaweed extract, we also published the data using seaweed extract uh, to improve plant growth. Seaweed extract, actually they have different kind of seaweed extract and some is storage type of the polysaccharide and some is the, like, uh, the, the polysaccharide for the cell wall. Uh, to my feeling is seaweed extract is even they got more narrow uh, function compared to protein hydrolyse and the uh, uh, PGPR, okay? And so we work with two kind of perceived extra before. One is the mineral, the other one is uh, arginic acid. You can see they promote plant growth, but not that dramatically. And they also can increase the uh, uh, abyss trail tolerance, however, they don't really work with the disease resistance. Uh, that is something that you cannot compare with PGPR. Human acid, we also tried human acid before. It doesn't work for me too much, okay? Uh, human acid is mainly to, uh, to modify the soil uh, quality. Uh, if you work human acid directly in the plant cell, they can show a little amount of uh, antioxidant activity, but you don't really see too much gross promotion effect, but you see a little bit of increasing abyss straight tolerance. But, so human acid is not really considered, we don't really consider human acid is kind of become a functional biostimulant in our lab and because we tried before. PGPR is really diverse. You can isolate the different kind of other strain in your environment from different kind of root rhizosphere. It's really fun and really have a lot of potential to get your own product. So right now we all focus on PGPR. The reason for that is you can have endless uh, kind of product because that all in your environment. That depends on how you do the analysis. So PGPR is actually have more potential to work on uh, in agricultural field. That's would be that, that would be my feeling for this. Actually, I work all I already done the experiment for all four kind of uh, biostimulant, and right now I only focus on PGPR. So you will know why <laughs> because it's more diverse product. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nafi is okay. Is it clear? 
Yeah, uh, Professor Chuang said, uh, between all the biostimulants, they have a specific uh, function. Uh, the broader function is BGPR and the narrowest is uh, seaweed extract. Okay, and uh, because the PGPR is have the broader function, so uh, Professor Chuang, I think in uh, their labs, yeah, uh, research more about the PGPR because PGPR can become biocontrol and also uh, can boost the plant growth in the same time. Okay, that's all from uh, no big question. So we go to the next question, please. Yeah, we wait for slide PPT. Okay, bisa ditampilkan. Please wait for a while, Professor Chuan. Uh, okay. We try to solve okay. the question. Okay. Okay. The next question uh, from Asih Widianing Room. The question is how to apply PGPR for plant? Is there any simple way to apply it? Apply it? And what kind of plant that can be applied by PGPR, especially to enhance the plant growth? Yeah. Okay, uh, you can apply PGPR by using the uh, bacteria directly. Mm -hmm. And or you can uh, apply the PGPR by just uh, obtain their supernatant and use their metabolite as a product. And in our lab right now, when we colorize this PGPR, we use like a, a microorganism directly. However, if we want to use it as like a, a product, formal product, we use the metabolite. The reason for that is the PGPR when you use the, the bacteria directly in the field, the field will have the environmental factor which can affect those microorganisms. Mm. So if your microorganisms grow very well in your lab top and you get this, uh, a healthy growth microorganism applied in your plants and get a positive result and you apply those microorganisms in the field. However, the environment in the field is not really good for this PGPR to produce those useful metabolites. And those PGPR will not work as good as the one you see in your lab, okay? So another turn is when you apply the PGPR directly in the field, you, you, get, you, you tend to get uh, you tend to get less stable uh, result. So in our lab, we usually use the metabolite, but when we just do the analysis with the uh, organism, microorganism directly, but when we try to uh, commercialize this uh, microorganism, we use the metabolite. That is one of the reason. And the other reason is why we use the metabolite is some of the bacteria strain is be considered a casual passage for human being. So if you apply those microorganisms directly to the field, you cause a lot of concern for the health, uh, human health problem. So if you use the metabolite, usually it's safer in the environment, okay? So what kind of a plant that you can use a prior picture? Almost theoretically, theoretically, every kind of plant you can apply. Uh, but it's... Uh, Usually in our lab, we just try the vegetable and the floral crop. We never try the fruit. It's because we don't have this such kind of material. Banana plant, we also only try the uh, banana uh, seedling, okay? So uh, theoretically, all, all, all kind of uh, crop, you can apply a PGPR, it's no problem, okay? Okay, so I see, I think clear. GBR can be applied by two form, the living microorganism and also the metabolite. And mm -hmm. yeah, between 
uh, the living organism, microorganism, and the metabolite, they have uh, the positive and negative. So maybe uh, if you apply the living microorganism of PGPR in any environment, we don't know the condition and environment, maybe they can influence the stability of microorganism. So mm -hmm. yes. uh, Professor yes. Chuang prefer to apply the metabolite because mm -hmm. it's quite stable in any environment and also uh, it's safer because some microorganism maybe have the potential uh, harm to the human being. Mm -hmm. I think that's clear. Okay. So, Professor Chuang, we go to the next question. Okay. Please, uh, committee, to show the PPT slide. Okay, from Farid, how the metabolism of aerobic bacteria produce the siderophore and how the condition of siderophore can bind to the iron? after that where the iron will go thank you okay so this is a a, 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 a actually it's kind of a biochemi biochemistry problem it's a sign oh. for actually yeah it's, it's uh the, this but you had had to be a gene that can encode uh enam to synthesize sign for okay and this cell level can take some of the cell level is in the cell. Some of the cell level can be secreted out. Okay. And when they secrete out in the, to the soil environment, this cell level can bind to uh, oxide form of iron, not reduced form of iron, oxide form of iron. Okay. After the binding this oxide form of iron, this cell level complex can be uptake by the cell directly. So it's kind of a discrete out something and then buy, after they bind the iron and they get this uh, complex uh, transported into the cell directly. And by doing that, some of this uh, uh, iron complex, the cell complex can be uptake by print cell. Print cell also have this kind of transporter on the membrane. They can uptake this kind of a uh, uh, cell level complex. So brain can use those iron, which is a bind to those cell for later in the cell. So do I ask you, answer your question? <laughs> yeah, very biochemistry. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, yeah, some iron uh, have constraint uh, to the, uh, yeah, to entrance the cell wall or cell membrane. So cyderopor is mm -hmm. uh, just like a mediator for the iron to enter the cell wall or cell membrane. Yeah, Cydropor is just like a mediator. I think yeah. like that. <laughs> and how the process is very biochemistry, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next question. Is there any question for Professor Chuang? Yeah, the next question from Irfan. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Professor Chuang. Is there any specific dose of PGPR induction on each type of plants? And would there are any means of necessary of additional induction of PGPR in mature plants that were already induced in case the outcome of the plant growth didn't come out as expected? I think about dose. Yeah, how the uh, optimum dose for each type of plants uh, I think, is it the plant need the different dose between horticulture plant or vegetable plants or another kind of plants? Okay, for the dose, I usually it's not, uh, I think plant species is not the important thing. Uh, it's something to do with the bacteria strain. Some bacteria strain, they can produce very high amount of secondary metabolite. So for that kind of PGPR, you use you need to use a uh, less amount of a uh, uh, bacteria dosage. Okay. Uh, so if you use the two, uh, just like the example, usually we calculate our PGPR. We use the dosage is ten to eight, a CFU per meal. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
by using that kind of a dosage of PGPR, in some case, we see the growth suppression. When we see this kind of result, we would reduce the PGPR uh, dosage by like reduced to 10 to 6 or 10 to 10 to 8, uh, 10 to 5 uh, uh, CFU per mil. It's because some of the bacteria you can see they can produce very strong like a smell fragrant when you open the bacterial culture. So you will guess they produce lots of secondary metabolite. So there's no specific dosage for uh, application of PGPI in plant, but usually in the field, people would like to use 10 to six and 10 to eight CFU, okay? Uh, that's why in Taiwan, the company who making the PGPI as a biofertilizer, they would require like, uh, they're making like a 10 to 10 CFU at least when they do the fermentation because they have to do dilution when they apply in the field, okay? So usually 10 to six is the minimum of the uh, PGPR you have to use in the field, mm -hmm. but there's no uh, fixed concentration. And sometimes if you use a very strong PGPR, you like to use the less but you have to test it in the, in the lab first to make a decision of what kind of dilution you want to use in, in the field, okay? Yeah, so and, if I'm uh, about the dose, actually there is uh, still, there is no exact or fixed dose about uh, EGPR application, but normally yes. and based on the lab, lab experiment, people usually use 10 to 6 and 10 to 8, is it correct? Yes. For the uh, CFU. And maybe if we think give more PGPR will uh, boost uh, more growth of plant, maybe not uh, always got the positive result because I think I remember Professor Chuang uh, have explained to the lab member when I uh, study at your lab, uh, more PGPR maybe can more activate the antioxidant system and more antioxidant system activated not uh, always mean the positive uh, effect because uh, high antioxidant activity maybe can uh, abolish the uh, hydrogen peroxide or ROS uh, species and this is not all, not good because some uh, ROS also become the growth signal for plant. So maybe if we give more PGPR, more antioxidant system activated and more ROS uh, loss and no uh, enough signal for plant growth, maybe. Yes. Oji is an excellent student. Are you oh, coming no. back to no. study PhD? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I still remember when you uh, explained about yes. this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you uh, for question from Irfan. Uh, we still can go to other question. Uh, Professor Chuang, please next uh, question. Ada pertanyaan? Oh, ada. Yeah, uh, another question from Ikhwan. Please explain how PGPR plays a role in protecting plants by inhibiting the activity of pathogens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Professor Chuang have explained what ESR and SAR. Maybe you can uh, explain more. Okay, so this uh, question uh, is uh, regarding the biocontrol and by for using the biocontrol uh, purpose and PGPR as Lots of people in Taiwan, I think in all of the world, they have to focus on whether this PGPR can secrete something uh, useful compound to suppress the pathogen growth directly. And that kind of compound sometimes is like a, a lipopeptide, just like a uterine, uh, very famous uterine or fingersine that produced by bacillus uh, species. And as I show you uh, in this presentation that uh, Solomas originosa, actually they can produce a strong, very strong uh, antibiotic compound, which is called phenazine. 
And this phenyl is a typical strong uh, iron chelating, which is a kind of cellular for iron chelating compound. So this phenyl produced by uh, PAY1, the Stomatus originosa that I presented today, as you can suppress those uh, um, fusarin oxyspora uh, TR4, which is uh, a banana fusarin weight passage very strongly. Okay, so that is a typical antibiotics compound that can produce by PGPR. But if you see that the compound produced by PGPR, which can suppress the pathogen activity, it's just the first step. Because when we try, because uh, we, we already analyzed that's the uh, Stomona genosa strain that we are presenting today, we analyzed there's a uh, three compound. The fantasy is the strongest one can inhibit that's pathogen growth. And the other one is like, uh, 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 I forgot that one. The other one is a uh, ramnolipid and the uh, oh quinolone compound. Okay, so there's a total of three compounds that produced by the sonomas originosa that all can suppress that that passage. That uh, oxyspora uh, passage. However, when we mix these three compounds together and apply them to the brain cell, brain still get sick when we inoculate the passage. That's mean. In addition to suppressing those pathogen growth, brain also require the induced immunity to get the full protection from a protection from those pathogen infection. Okay, so I will answer the question is, uh, you need both. It's better that you can the PGPR can inhibit, can produce compound inhibit pathogen growth, but this PGPR also need to be a strong activator to activate brain immunity response. And that will give a good uh, biocontrol uh, efficiency, okay? okay? I think clear, Iquan. So uh, EGBR can uh, improve the immunity of one uh, through the ISR or SAR by a specific signal such as TA or SA, but in other side, uh, EGPR also can improve the uh, tolerance from pathogen by producing some antibiotics such as phytoalexin and also phenolic compound. So uh, this protection is complex, make the plants getting healthier in any environment which pathogen also live in there. I think clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, is it still any question from participants? Yeah, from Raja. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Chua. What are the advantage and disadvantage from the PGPR? Uh, especially if this kind of PGPR is carried out in Indonesia agricultural environment. And will the implementation of PGPR be easily understood by farmers in Indonesia? Yeah, uh, little information in Indonesia, uh, most of uh, farming system is still uh, in conventional uh, farming system. So maybe farmer uh, still doing the cultivation with the conventional uh, technique such as uh, give the fertilizer only with the uh, synthetic fertilizer or chemical fertilizer. So how about your your opinion, Professor Chang, about this? Okay. Yeah, I, uh, because um, I think the, the, the problem for using PCBI in Indonesia, I think is similar in Taiwan before, like Taiwan uh, occurring the, the similar problem before. It's because when the, uh, chemical fertilizer is cheaper and convenient to use in the field. And most of the time, farmer will tend to use those uh, chem chemical fertilizer or like, uh, uh, like a, a pesticide, something like that. But in Taiwan right now, uh, the government already subsidized uh, for the price uh, for biofertilizer and half for biofertilizer and fully subsidized for using the uh, bio uh, pesticide, something like PGPI used as a, a pesticide, something like that. 
Okay, so that would depend on the government's policy. And the reason uh, uh, the Taiwanese government uh, like to do this kind of uh, money uh, support in uh, using the PTPR as a uh, agricultural product is because of environmental uh, problem. And we, because we are tiny island and we have a high uh, population density. So uh, agriculture system actually cause lots of uh, uh, environmental problem in Taiwan. Okay, so we have to face this problem. So I think it has to be uh, rely on education. So I understand that at the beginning it will be difficult, but you still have to try because in, this, in your condition right now is the biochemical for that is still cheap, right? And still get subs, uh, subsidized from the government. I don't know if that is true uh, because I somebody told me before, uh, you still got the uh, government still pay you some money, uh, uh, subsidize some money by using the, those uh, biochemical, uh, that, those are uh, chemical fertilizer. If that is true, that would not easy to, uh, to change the farmer's habit because as human being, we are human being, I know that it's easy and cheap. Why we use uh, something sure. more expensive and it's not convenient. And as I mentioned before, most of the product for PGPR is using a living organism in the field. The result is not really consistent from one application to the other application. So that is one of the problem uh, for the PGPR by fertilizer or by fenocide using in Taiwan right now. Still, most of the product is living organism. They still that comes, they don't have stable outcome in the field. And so it, they got that's a complaint from the farmer. Okay, so one way is you want to do more education and or you want to change your uh, product uh, production be, become a more stable product that uh, the farmer can use it and get a very uh, very efficient uh, outcome. So that would persuade them to use more for those PGP. Yeah. And another thing is uh, Maybe that is because the environmental uh, uh, factor like the weather change a lot and the like uh, the heat stress and the drought stress and those kind of uh, bio stress uh, cannot be resolved by using chemical fertilizer. Okay, however, PGPR can help plant to overcome those uh, bio stress uh, condition. Okay, so maybe that's another way to uh, to. To, to teach the farmer in Indonesia the good thing advantage to use the PGP in the field. But still, if it's uh the if the price is higher, our vision it will be difficult to uh tell the farmer to switch the chemical fertilizer to PGP. Yeah. Just yeah. have to you have to just have to uh let your government know they have to put the money in this field. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's uh, quite true because uh, chemical fertilizer in Indonesia is still uh, now is partly subsidized, not fully subsidized, but still a uh, farmer uh, choose the chemical one because yeah, cheaper. So they choose the cheaper. But uh, I, I agree with the professor's strong opinion. Uh, even uh, this is hard, but uh, we have to do something. So I think uh, students uh, learn a lot about agriculture in school. So I think you guys have to uh, uh, give uh, have the responsibility to educate the farmer, uh, give the information how the potential using the PGPR or the sustainability of environment. Yeah, so I agree with your opinion. Okay, uh, next question, please. Okay, from Septi. Uh, as you have explained before, I would like to ask the mechanism how microorganism in PGPR Possessing the survival ability of changing its membrane phospholipid composition when subjected to stress condition. Yeah, so the mechanism of PGPR, uh, 
they the survival ability to change the membrane phospholipid when the plant or cell is subjected to stress. Okay, so it's mainly because the inarsen activity. So when plant uh, under a biostress environment, and the always the accumulated in like a chloroplast or in uh, like a polysome or mitochondria, actually many is in chloroplast because chloroplast is a major always production uh, location in the brain cell. Those always can oxidize uh, the membrane uh, phospholipid compound. So that would destroy the membrane structure. And by doing that, that uh, the chloroplast, the function for the chloroplast will be destroyed because the, the chloroplast, uh, they, have, they should have a function for photosynthesis is the light reaction should occurring on the membrane of the chloroplast, right? And so once this uh, chloroplast membrane is destroyed, it, it, it will be damaged, the photosynthesis will be, this, uh, will be inhibited. So under that kind of condition, the cell membrane uh, is uh, destroyed in the chloroplast that will be the first step. And then they will affect the, because chloroplast will make it carbohydrates. So that was the main uh, energy uh, molecule in the brain cell. So by doing that, the brain will go slower and more, they will accumulate more uh, aesthetic stress. And then later they will get uh, aesthetic in the cell membrane and later all the membrane destroy, the electrolyte will leaking out. That's why we all detect the MDA, which is uh, uh, the prostation product in the cell membrane. And we also de uh, detect the electrolyte leakage uh, percentage which is indicate the cell, uh, the, the disrupted uh, cell structure. So usually the PGPR, they can activate enhancement uh, activity. So they can reduce hours. So the membrane will be safer. So the, the mem uh, brain can keep their function like uh, for the synthesis or the cell function. So by doing that, they can increase the brain's uh, uh, the survival rate under different kind of bias stress condition. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, Septi, is it clear? Yeah, if you remember about the photosynthesis process in the light reaction located in the membrane, uh, the process yeah. from those process is also result uh, oxygen byproduct. So uh, from those process, also produce several kind of ROS, reactive oxygen species. When the ROS is higher, getting higher, so uh, they can oxidize the membrane, I think like that. And then when the antioxidant uh, did not produce in the same level, so the ROS could destroy the membrane. So the BTPR is work in the activate the antioxidant system, uh, both antioxidant system enzyme or compound, and by activation of antioxidant, so the R uh, ROAs also can uh, normalize. Yeah, because uh, ROS and antioxidant is kind of uh, well, uh, the things of balance. So when ROS is higher, so we can got the cell destruction, but when the antioxidant uh, can in the same level with the ROS, so I think cell will uh, more normal in the structure or function. Yeah, I think that's a question from Septi. So, uh, we have another question, Professor Chuang. Yes. Please. <laughs> Next question, please. Okay. Yeah, for from Marmi, how about mycorrhiza and rhizobacteria association on plant, and how the most effective on controlling the pathogen? Yeah, mycorrhiza and rhizobacteria. 
Okay. Uh, rhizobacteria actually is the a a a broader term. So all the PGP actually is uh, uh rhizobacteria, right? Okay. And micro uh microanza actually is one of the PGP. Okay. And microanza is not really uh, we don't really isolate microanza because it's a fungi. Okay. And also microanza is more associated specific. Uh, it's a symbiotic associated with a uh, specific uh, plant species. So usually we don't really uh, get too much attention to microanza. And usually in, in my lab before there's a student from, uh, from I don't know which, uh, from foreign, foreign country, I don't know which country. She actually focused on isolate the microanza uh, from the uh, forest, uh, from the tree. And so they want to isolate the microanza and inoculate back to those tree to make the tree get healthier. Okay. So I don't have too much idea about uh, microanza because it's very different system uh, from the, the uh, most of the PGB I will discuss today. However, the microanza usually is uh, promoting water and phosphate use for uh, efficiency. For the controlling disease resistant, I don't really read too much of the paper uh, describing the microanza uh, function in controlling disease uh, infection. Okay, so, but I do hear some uh, product in Taiwan, they claim their product can enhance disease resistance in certain uh, crop. Mm. But again, uh, we try, actually we try microanza once and we, in, uh, we try to inoculate microanza in our plant and it's not easy. It's kind of, they have a very different system. It's not really easy to uh, inoculate microanza in the regular crop like a tomato or like a cucumber uh, in, in the lab. Uh, it's difficult. It's really painful to work on microanza actually, and because it's a uh, fungi and difficult to isolate the DNA. And it's very different from the system we're working on right now. So, but for the disease resistant, um, I don't think so. I don't think because there's, there's no too much paper publication uh, describing this kind of function, okay? Okay, so Mary, uh, the difference between rhizo, rhizobacteria and mycorrhiza is first is fungi and the second is bacteria. And both of uh, mycorrhiza and rhizobacteria uh, living in the rhizosphere. So the same thing is they living in the rhizosphere. But uh, so far, uh, Professor Chuan haven't uh, found a lot uh, experiment or research about mycorrhiza for the protection of plant from pathogen. So uh, still the rhizobacteria is have the broader spectrum of function in the uh, booster the plant growth and also uh, contribute the, <clears throat> the protection from the pathogen. Yeah, I think that's all. So uh, still have uh, some question, uh, please. From Yulita, is it possible and effective to induce PGPR by seed submersion of Mimosa pudica root PGPR? Is it effective enough to apply such induction method? Yeah. Okay, what is a mi Mimosa pudica? Oh. What is that? This kind of plant uh, that's sensitive uh, with the touch stimulus. So when we touch this kind of plant, the leaf will close. Yeah, I think that's... the leaf will close. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so some uh, some people do uh, submerge those uh, seeds in the PGPR solution before they germinate in uh, in the they, they germinate in the in the soil, and they. Some of the PGP actually can really uh, enhance germination rate in certain kind of uh, seeds. Uh, you can give it a try. I think it, it is it possible. And 
but uh, the dosage, I don't know whether you can try the same dosage that you apply in the whole plan. But if you have a PGPI in hand, just try, give it a try and use different kind of dosage like a 10 to six maybe or less. And because if you use too high concentration, I cannot worry with, whether you can create a stress to those seeds, but just have to try. We, we haven't tried those yet in the lab. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you can try uh, extract the PGPR from the Mimosa Pudica root. I think uh, not specific uh, from Mimosa Pudica, any kind of soil that uh, looks fertile. Also, you can uh, try to explore uh, whether the PGPR is good from those sources or not. Yeah. Next question, please. From Muhimatul Ifada, uh, as from your study result, Bacillus uh, lysiniformis can be an antagonist for fungal. I was curious about the possibility or the effectivity in order to control the fungal and how long it can last after the first application. Yeah, Bacillus lysiniformis. Yeah, could be the antagonist for the fungal. Okay, this Bacillus lysiniformis they can uh, suppress the uh, fungal. Go the mycelium goes of a uh, fusarium or the spore run, TR4. Okay, but it doesn't show the similar effect to like uh, other kind of uh, fungal strain. So it's specific to this. Uh, mm -hmm. This pathogen, and but we haven't because we have two sulfurserine in the lab, so this uh, bacillus lysiniformis is effective to suppress this uh, fusarium oxyspora, but it's not really effective to suppress like uh, fusarium solani, which is called yellow leaf in Phalaenopsis orchid. Okay, so you just have to try uh, bacillus lysiniformis. It can suppress one. Fungal strain, but it doesn't mean it can separate all, all other pathogen, a fungal pathogen. You just have to try one by one. Okay. And for how long this uh, activity can last, we never really test. But if you are considering the, the, the length for this uh, antifungal, antifungal activity, then you will consider it as a pesticide. Okay. So we never really consider. Our bacteria strain is kind of a pesticide. We don't really, we don't really pay too much attention to how much they can kill those pathogens. Because if you really only consider this bacteria strain, the effective of this pathogen killing the pathogen, you consider your PGP as a like a pathogen or like a fungicide, something like that, a, a pesticide or fungicide. So it's no different from those conventional. Uh, like a fungicide or pesticide use. So usually, like I mentioned before, this biocontrol effect should derive from the antifungal activity plus the activated immunity in the plant cell. It's, a, it's kind of a combinational effect from both sides that you can get a good biocontrol bio uh, activity from the PGPR. Okay, so we never really test how long this antifungal activity can last for one specific PGPR strain. Okay. Yeah, because uh, PGPR is uh, beyond the pesticide or beyond the fungicide because uh, the way of PGPR to protect the, protect the plant from pathogen is because uh, PGPR also can boost the immunity of plant. So I think, uh, yeah, beyond the fungicide or pesticide. So next, how to make, uh, can you please the show, show the slide, show PPT slide, please. Still another question, how to make PGPR solution? Can we use coconut water or bamboo root 
as ingredients? Is there any difference from the ingredients? Yeah, that's the question, Professor Chua. Okay, okay I, I think you can uh, culture the PGPR in uh, any kind of medium, uh, but you have to make sure your PGPR have a nitrogen source, have a carbon, carbohydrate uh, source, and also make, uh, magnesium uh, source, okay? So the nitrogen source, of course, like uh, people that a, I don't know why it's a coconut water. The, 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 I don't know, coconut water is a carbohydrate source or, or vitamin, no, vitamin source. I, I have no idea, vitamin. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but more rules, I think is, it's kind of a nitrogen source, right? Or like yeah. a carbohydrate source, okay. So in the lab, we use like a, uh, it's extra and the pectone for the nitrogen source. And we use the magnesium sulfide and we use the sucrose for the carbohydrate source. So as mm -hmm. long as you think your ingredient contain this uh, kind of three source, I think that will be okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually coconut water is a uh, rich uh, vitamin and phytohormone. So, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Auxin is one of phytohormone uh, uh, in coconut milk. Yeah, in okay. coconut water. So uh, in plant tissue culture, we usually subsidize the mm -hmm. media with the coconut water because they reach uh, phytohormone. But okay. uh, true, the PGPR is living cell microorganisms. So they have to get the carbon, nitrogen, magnesium. So the media... Uh, must contain those kind of compound. So mm -hmm. I think carbohydrate from uh, sucrose and then nitrogen from yeast or pepton and also uh, magnesium. But you guys, if you can find the compound, the natural compound that contain those kind of uh, compounds, sucrose and nitrogen or magnesium, you can uh, use it. Is it correct, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Rinalda. Uh, is there any question? Atau masih ada pertanyaan kah? Sudah? Okay, sudah habis pertanyaannya. I think the question uh, enough or uh, question from the participant. Uh, Maybe from a uh, professor from the agroecotechnology, if you got, if you have any question or comments to Professor Chuang, uh, you can say it in the uh, this meeting. Yeah. I think uh, there is Pak Budi, Prof Saiful, uh, Prof Kos, or Pak Karno. If you have any question or comments. To our guest lecturer today, uh, please. Yeah, or enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all for okay. uh, the question today. Uh, very, uh, in we have we got the new insight and also knowledge from uh, Professor Chuang, and by the end of discussion, uh, I can say. Thank you very much for uh, Professor Chuang uh, sure. already give us the nice lecture about PGPR. Actually, uh, a lot of our students uh, doing the research about PGPR, but uh, some students still curious about uh, the mechanism of PGPR to boost the plant growth. So I think this lectural uh, this lecture could be suitable for the student uh, that uh, still doing research about PGPR right now. So I think this the end uh, from the lecture session. We can give the virtual applause for the Professor Chuang, please. Thank you, Professor Chuang, sure. for your uh, nice lecture today. And I think that's all from this session. 
I will give back the time to the MC. Thank you. Okay, thank you to Professor Chuan and also to Pak Karno and also uh, Uoji for the interesting uh, discussion. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the ending of guest lecture, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and its application in improving plant quality and plant abiotic stress tolerance. Organized by Agro Eco Technology Study Program, Department of Agriculture, Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Sciences, Universitas Diponegoro. I hope you guys got a lot of information from this session. Thank you so much for your participation and see you on another occasion. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Yeah, thank you, teacher. <laughs> so, can I leave right now? <laughs> yeah. Thank All you right. very much and stay healthy. Okay. All right. You too. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.